So I was just saying that this um, is a 16th century painting in the Vatican, <clears throat> which I've seen. And actually, this takes up a whole wall. It's not just like a, a picture on a, on, a, on a frame. It's actually the whole side of a, a building, basically. And th this, uh, in the Renaissance, uh, was meant to show the, the greatest thinkers in the world. And the very heart of this, they say, is Plato and Aristotle. And you can barely make it out, but there, that Plato there, and his hand is raised up like that. He's kind of motioning upwards. And that guy, Aristotle, is putting his hand like that, motioning downwards. And this, in a symbolic way, is meant to tell us something about these two guys. So Plato is basically pointing to the transcendent, what we would call God or the divine. And Aristotle is uh, looking at the world. And I'll, I'll, come, I'll go into a bit more detail exactly what that meant in a minute. But interestingly, the other uh, few characters, is Ibn, um, Ibn Sina is here somewhere. I can't quite work it out from this, but he's over here somewhere. Um, so there are some Arab philosophers as well. Um, but that's just an opening portrait of Western tradition, Western civilization at, at its most proud, I suppose. Um, so coming back to the handouts, if I can just check um, with you. So I've got uh, a glossary here. Uh, you should all have a glossary. Basically, what's going on in very brief form today, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, and today we're going to look at the, what is the Western tradition and why should we care about it? Um, we're going to look briefly at Hellenism, obviously define what that is, Plato and Aristotle, and, and, uh, and a, a few remarks on Judaism, which covers a similar kind of time period. And on Thursday, inshallah, we'll look at... Um, the Jewish Bible, Jesus, the Gospels, that's the four New Testament Gospels, and the early church up to the Emperor Constantine, beginning of the medieval period. Christianity, the Bible, has been hugely influential, obviously, in the West, and still is to some extent even today, and that's now gone global, of course. Sunday, we'll look at the, sorry, Saturday, I should say, the next one, uh, we'll look at the Renaissance, and this is a, a Renaissance artwork, and the Reformation, um, two hugely important influential periods in Western history. What is the Renaissance? Why does it matter? And the Reformation, looking particularly at Erasmus, Martin Luther, and John Calvin. And then the following day, looking at the Enlightenment, as it's called, or the Age of Reason, there's another name for it, um, basically from the 17th century up to the 19th century. And we'll look briefly at Kant, probably the greatest of modern philosophers, since Descartes anyway. Um, and look at one of his ideas, the idea of moral autonomy without God. Um, it's called the categorical imperative. Fascinating. Briefly look at Sir Isaac Newton, an Englishman, um, epitomizing enlightenment science. The French Revolution, of course, in 1789, hugely influential around the world. Look at Karl Marx, uh, the Communist Manifesto. Uh, Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche, another very influential Western philosopher, whose thought is still very popular today, and Western colonialism, um, civilizing the natives, as the French like to put it, unfortunately, and the uh, dethroning of the Bible. And then on Tuesday, we'll go into the 20th century and we'll look at the, uh, the feminism. Uh, there's usually said to be four waves of feminism, apparently riding the last wave at the moment, the fourth one. And um, look briefly at, at one of my favorite uh, philosophical texts from the 20th century, book called Nausea by Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, and I'll explain why I think that's, um, in a sense, emblematic of the West's nihilism at the moment. Um, look briefly at uh, the triumph of liberal democracy after the Second World War, uh, thanks to American military power and hegemony, the secularization of the churches in the West, which is at an advanced terminal stage now, I would argue. And the, the famous Time magazine cover in the 1960s, I'll put that up later, uh, is God dead? That was the question that was seriously posed in the 1960s, famously. And Islam is the only world religion that has not succumbed to secular liberalism. And then lastly, on Wednesday, what are the challenges facing Muslims today from the Western tradition? Um, and the latest threat, as I call it, is Islam and LGBT. LGBTQ. I'm sure there are other letters I've missed out from there. Uh, fill in the blank spaces if you can think of them for yourself. It's a movie. Yeah, the alphabet people, <coughs> I tend to call them, tend to have new letters added with alarming frequency. Um, so that's kind of a brief overview of um, the uh, introduction to the Western tradition. 
Um, and I handed out also, I uh, hope you got it, a glossary. Um, if you don't have it, let me know. There are some copies. Um, these are just some of the, the more, um, the terms I wanted to just define a bit more closely. So the top of the list, there have got Alexander the Great, Hellenization and Aristotle. Those three are for today, really. And the rest are for following sessions. Um, the most difficult one I find to define was the last one, postmodernism, which when I looked into it, you know, as many definitions as there are postmodernists. So uh, anyway, that's my best stab at what postmodernism is. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, thank you very much indeed. Um, for further discussion, I've got um, some recommended reading um, on another handout. Uh, I've got books that are asterisks are highly recommended in my view. And videos on blogging theology. <laughs> Um, I mean, there's so many one could ch chosen, but the LGBT, the Islam issue with Dr. Carl El Tubki is just amazing. And I'll be focusing on that on the last day here. And why the West is wrong about Islam with Peter O'Born, uh, a celebrated British journalist who um, has some amazing things to say about why the West is wrong about Islam. Although he's not a Muslim, he's actually a Christian. So that's a very brief overview, hopefully, of what we're going to be doing. Um, so coming back to uh, this picture, so I would argue that Western civilization traces its roots back to Europe and the Mediterranean, and it's linked to ancient Greece, uh, the Roman Empire, and with the medieval Christian church, which emerged from the medieval period, the Middle Ages, to produce the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution, and the development of secular liberalism. And societies, as I'm sure you know, are shaped by ideas, not just by economic forces like Marxists would claim, uh, but are also by ideas, thoughts, concepts. And the modern world, particularly the so-called Western world that we find ourselves in or heavily influenced by, is a result of many political, philosophical, cultural, religious ideas from over two and a half thousand years. Um, we'll explore how some of these ideas came into being. I'm, I'm not going to look at all of them, by the way. It's just a, a few uh, really important ones. I'm just going to touch on those. How these ideas came into being, how they shape our thinking even today, and the challenges that believers in the West face in current times. So there's a lot, of, uh, lot to talk about. Now, I don't intend to give you a blow-by-blow -blow history of each century over the past 2,500 years. You'll be glad to hear um, but as I said, we're going to touch today on um, Hellenistic thought. Um, and as I say, this is, this actually, I forgot to tell you, the name of this is called the School of Athens. So as a painting by, as I say, Raphael. And uh, it's seen as Raphael's masterpiece and a perfect embodiment of the classical spirit of the Renaissance. Now, I think it's true to say that the man known in the West as Alexander the Great was the most significant world conqueror in the history of Western civilization. And this is what apparently he looked like. That's the dude, Alexander the Great. Now he was born in 356 BCE, before the Common Era, that means 350 years before Christ basically. And he succeeded to the throne of Macedonia as a 21 year old after his father was assassinated and Alexandra was single-minded in his desire to conquer the lands of the Eastern Mediterranean. And as a brilliant military strategist, he overran Greece, modern-day Turkey, Egypt, Palestine, and finally marched into the heart of the Persian Empire. And he even reached modern-day India. Um, and here briefly is a map of where he went. So. Macedonia is kind of over here, where Greece is, and he swept East, Egypt, Turkey, uh, all the way through what we now call Iraq and Persia, all the way up to India. And he died when he was a young man as well, but he was phenomenally accepted. And he's called Alexander the Great. Okay, so I think it's quite interesting. That's how he's known in the West. I saw this tweet a few months ago. Someone said, <coughs> Alexander the Great. The successful military co commander, Mohammed, peace be upon him, warlord. Hmm. The double standard ceases to amaze. This is how 
the perception in the West is very, um, <laughs> speaks for itself. Now, Alexandra uh, received a Greek education. He was a Greek, obviously, tutored by none other than the great philosopher Aristotle, who we're going to focus on a bit today. And he considered Greek culture superior to all other cultures. And as, he, uh, as a conqueror, he promoted Greek language and culture throughout his huge empire, building theatres, gymnasiums, where people, by the way, used to exercise naked, public baths, and building Greek-style cities. And this process is known as Hellenization. Uh, I've defined that in the glossary if you want to know more about that term. So um, just to stress this point here, I think in the West, we uncritically admire Alexandra. He conquered peoples, assimilated them, imposed his culture, educated the natives and so on. Um, a far greater man, uh, Prophet Muhammad upon who of course was not quite like that, but nevertheless, he is seen in a very different light in the West. Um, and you can see the double standards, I think, quite clearly there. Now, his teacher, uh, Alexander's teacher, was a guy called Aristotle, uh, who was born in 384 BC. And it's difficult, I think, to overstate his influence in the West over the last 2,000 years. And he's still widely read today, um, as indeed his uh, one of his books, the, the Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Very easy to get his work. Now, his writings cover many subjects because he was a polymath extraordinaire. So his writings cover physics, biology, zoology. He founded these sciences, by the way. He didn't just contribute. He founded zoology, biology, physics, metaphysics, logic, ethics, aesthetics, poetry, theater, music, rhetoric, psychology, linguistics, economics, politics, meteorology, geology, and government, and of course, philosophy. That's probably why he's most widely known now. If you look, if you look at Wikipedia, look up zoology, if you look up biology, if you look up logic, you know, his name comes right at the top as a guy who really made fundamental new contributions or founded these schools of thought, really. <clears throat> now, his thought has exerted a unique influence on almost every form of knowledge in the West, and it continues to be a subject of philosophical discussion today. Now, I want to give you a flavour of his thought uh, by reading to you a, a passage from his book on ethics. And uh, this is the book here. I'm just going to stand here because it's easy for me to prop myself up. Now, <clears throat> this book is about ethics. It's actually a bunch of lecture notes by a guy called uh, Nicomachus, Nicomachus, who I think was his son. Um, so they were never actually intended for publication, but uh, they're still avidly read now. And we have the, the notes. And I just want to give you a flavor of what he said and, and perhaps why it's significant. And this is almost a random selection from his book on ethics. And I quite like this one. It's called Shame. He's writing about shame as a kind of quasi-virtue. And Aristotle says this, shame should not be described as a virtue, for it is more like a passion than a state of character. It is defined at any rate as a kind of fear of dishonor and produces an effect similar to that produced by fear of danger. For people who feel disgraced blush and those who fear death turn pale. Both, therefore, seem to be, in a sense, bodily conditions, which is thought to be characteristic of passion rather than a state of character. The passion is not becoming to every age, but only to youth, he says. So it's only attractive, it's only relevant to youth, he claims, but only to youth. For we think young people should be prone to shame because they live by passion and therefore commit many errors but are restrained by shame. And we praise young people who are prone to this passion. But an older person, no one would praise for being prone to a sense of disgrace, since we think he should not do anything that need cause this sense. For the sense of disgrace is not even characteristic of a good man, since it is consequent on bad actions for such actions should not be done. And if some actions are disgraceful in very truth and others only according to common opinion, this makes no difference. 
for neither class of actions should be done so that no disgrace should be felt. And it is a mark of a bad man even to be so so it's a mark of a bad man, even to be such as to do any disgraceful actions. To be so constituted as to feel disgraced if one does such an action, and for this reason to think oneself good, is absurd. For it is voluntary actions that shame is felt, and the good man will never voluntarily do bad actions, says Aristotle. But shame may be said to be conditionally a good thing. If a good man does such actions, he will feel disgraced. But the virtues are not subject to such a qualification. And if shamelessness, not to be ashamed, uh, not to be ashamed of doing base actions is bad, that does not make it good to be ashamed of doing good actions. And then he concludes, continence too is not virtue, but a mixed sort of state. This will be shown later, he says. Now, however, let us discuss justice, which we're not going to do. So justice is a huge subject um, in philosophy. Now, as a former Christian, uh, having studied the New Testament, um, the Gospels or Paul's letters and so on, I can tell you that there's very relatively little in those books to do with virtue between good and bad, and no detailed discussion. Yes, there may be a few lists of sins or wrongdoings, but you don't get this great psychological, philosophical insight into motives, character, virtue, morality, that you get very extensively in Aristotle. And I mention that because um, I think that Aristotle's work um, proved to be so popular because it filled a gap, particularly in the Christian West, when Aristotle's work was rediscovered uh, many centuries later, particularly in Christianity. And you know, there's so much of it uh, in Aristotle. Um, so I think it, it fills that big gap and gives a lot, a lot of practical thinking and uh, ways of working out how to be good that the Christian tradition basically didn't give you in its biblical texts anyway. <clears throat> so um, today, uh, Aristotle is still very influential in something called virtue ethics, uh, particularly associated with people like Alistair MacIntyre. He was a Scottish slash British American philosopher uh, residing in the States. He wrote a very, a very famous book called Virtue Ethics, which is uh, basically reviving Aristotelian moral philosophy based on Aristotle's understanding of the virtues. So if you study philosophy or ethics at university now, even today in the West, you're going to come across Aristotle uh, not just as he was, but as he is still influencing moral discourse today. And people like Alistair McIntyre think, you know, that, that they are very aware of the decline of the West in many areas, morally, spiritually, lacking a foundation for action. And they think that Aristotle plus someone called Aquinas, we'll come to another time, are the best basis for a moral order in today's world. But I remain skeptical of that because that basically means reviving the medieval Christian tradition, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon. I think that that boat is gone, that, that ship has passed in the night. Um, there is another another faith on the scene, um, which I'll talk about as well. <clears throat> so um, now I just want to talk a bit um, about um, his teacher, um, Aristotle's teacher, I mean, and that is uh, Plato. <clears throat> And Plato, um, in some ways, is equally important to the West as Aristotle. Um, he taught Aristotle, as I say. And Plato, or Platonism, or Platonic ethics, or is uh, very widely influential today, perhaps less so than Aristotle, but hugely influential in the last couple of thousand years. And uh, he was a philosopher um, who... Um, I won't go into all his, all his work, but one of his most famous books is called The Republic um, by Plato, which is on the recommended reading list, I think. And this has been very influential in terms of politics, how to rule a just society, what is justice. Um, and, and he looks at different forms of government. He looks at monarchy, autocracy, democracy, um, and the rule by philosophers, philosopher kings, which is what his preferred system of government. 
And I mention this because um, this was written two and a half thousand years ago, this book called The Republic. And if you read his detailed discussions of the monarchical system, you know, a system ruled by a king or the democratic system ruled by the people or uh, an autocrat, a tyranny, you know, ruled by a dictator and so on. His, his comments are really modern. They, they really struck me as still a lot to teach us. For example, his criticism of democracy, which is almost forbidden in the West because it's like the air we breathe, it's the natural system. It's, um, are very, very insightful. This is one of the reasons I recommend this book. Because he talks about the influence of, I mean, I'm translating it now into a kind of modern idiom. He didn't use these terms, but he talks about the influence of pressure groups, you know, un unelected groups of people who uh, influence the democratic process, you know, uh, um, disproportionately. Uh, he talks about the power of wealth, money. If you think about America, for example, you want to stand to be president. You've got, of course, anyone can stand to be, anyone could be president. You just, you've got to have a huge amount of money, billions and billions of dollars just to, uh, be able to campaign and, uh, and get access to the airwaves and so on. That's another uh, problem he sees with democracy. Um, and also, perhaps more controversially, he, you know, the idea that, that the common man has wisdom that can, can, can rule a society well as well. You know, what, what, why should the people be able to rule successfully? Um, you know, what, why is that a wise form of government? So Plato ends up... Um, in with a system that not many have looked at to, uh, to, to take seriously for today, but the rule of philosopher kings. <clears throat> so people like Plato, for example, who have access to divine truth, um, who are wise, uh, who know what it is to rule. Th these people should uh, be our rulers. Um, and I think that, I think he was actually very Mussolini liked um, Plato a lot in the 1930s. Surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> um, as a fascist philosophy was very keen on Plato too. But he's been very influential uh, amongst many, many speakers, uh, sorry, philosophers and thinkers. Now, there's one other guy I want to mention uh, before I forget called Socrates. So there's Plato, there's his teacher of Aristotle, and then there's a guy called Socrates who's hugely popular, almost as popular as Jesus Christ in the West. You know, you get Socrates, you get Jesus Christ. And these are hugely uh, influential figures. Now, we don't actually have anything written by Socrates, but what we have is a bunch of dialogues, like written conversations uh, that Plato wrote, where Socrates, his teacher, this Athenian dude, this guy from, guy from Athens, <clears throat> is basically portrayed as going around having conversations with people. So he'd go up to experts who knew what they were talking about, like an expert in ethics or an expert in virtue or an expert in piety and say, say to this guy, so tell me, uh, I, I don't know anything, he said. You know, I'm certain of one thing, says Socrates, that I know nothing. That's my one bit of certain knowledge that I don't know anything. That was his persona. Of course, he was brilliant. I mean, this is no fool. And so he'd approach these guys and say, so what, 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 is, what is virtue or what is piety? And this, this hapless guy who fancied himself to be an expert would give an answer, you know, or what is courage? Well, courage is, you know, fortitude of soul or something. And Socrates would then uh, ask particularly good questions and he would question and he would basically end up showing that this guy didn't know what he was talking about. Um, and this is called the Socratic method. And this is a standard term in philosophy, the Socratic method. And it's a way of quizzing someone. It's a way of reasoning and thinking using logic, um, questioning assumptions, not just taking anything on board, and not necessarily having answers, but just to ask difficult questions. Well, what do you mean by virtue? Well, in the light of these set of facts, how can your definition of virtue be true? Socrates would ask. And always in the dialogues, which are quite comical in a way, um, the poor guy who Socrates was talking to would end up completely dumbfounded, defeated, and basically admitting he doesn't know what he's talking about. And does Socrates teach a positive message? Mm, I'm not sure he does. And that's open for debate anyway. But the Socratic method has been very influential in the West, uh, in the Renaissance, in the modern era, about how to think, how to think logically, rationally, critically, how not just accept things, but to use your reason 
Um, and people value him for that, not necessarily for the answers, he doesn't necessarily have any answers, but for a way of thinking. I'm just pricking at sort of pompous people who think they've got all the answers as well. Um, now, Socrates, you, you, you won't be surprised to learn, was a very divisive figure in Athens where he lived. And a lot of people in Athenian society turned against him, particularly the powerful. And he was condemned to death for corrupting youth, of all things. He was seen as corrupting youth. That was the charge. Because he questioned them, you know, he's questioning these people about how could you believe in these things, you know, and it seems corrupting. Some people, anyway. He was actually condemned to death. And um, his execution method was hemlock, which is a poison. So um, the guy actually was executed, although he was given chances to escape. Um, but he felt that it was his duty to obey the law. And in the last days of Socrates, this is a, um, which I do recommend, is a, 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 a dialogue with Socrates and his uh, friends and supporters. He speaks very eloquently about life after death. He doesn't fear being executed because he knows there is a life after death and that he will survive and join the other god, join the gods. He was, he was a polytheist. Um, so he was executed. So he seems a martyr figure. So you can see with the comparison with Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is seen as a martyr figure. Socrates was a martyr for uh, philosophical truth, where Jesus seems a martyr for well, a different subject, whatever he was a martyr for. Um, so that's uh, Socrates, um, who, as I say, was kind of taught Plato. Plato, this great philosopher of politics and ethics, and then Aristotle, who taught Alexander the Great, of all people, uh, who is called the Great in the West, even though he was just a guy who conquered a lot of people, imposed his culture on them. Um, but the, the Hellenization of the West means that the West as an idea, as an ideal, with Greek thought, culture, ideas, lifestyle, goes back to that time. But there is an, another influence which kind of unnaturally mixes, in my view, this is my, my opinion, unnaturally mixes with it. And, and that is Judaism. And what's Judaism got to do? Well, you know, Judaism as a faith, of course, existed um, long before then, long before Plato and Aristotle. It goes back to, well, depending when you date it from, Moses, perhaps, as the lawgiver to Israel, Abraham before, depending on how you, the Jews like to think of Abraham as Jew, Muslims don't because he wasn't a Jew uh, and Christians tend to see him as uh, one of their great prophets. But um, it was alleged uh, until recently that Plato knew, knew of Moses and had read the Old Testament, but that's not true. There's no way he would have, there's no evidence he knew anything about him. <clears throat> but I'm not, I'm not going to go into the Bible today or anything like that because it's, that's for another day. But I, I want to talk about <clears throat> the crossover between Hellenization and Judaism, because they did blend, or there was a synthesis. And uh, I'll give you an example of this in um, the writings of Alexander, uh, the writings of Philo of Alexandria, another uh, Alexander guy. So Alexandria, Alexandria is a city in Egypt, of course, named after Alexander the Great. And there's a guy called Philo, that's P-H-I-L-O, who lived there um, at about the time of Jesus, or just before, actually. Um, and he was probably the most important Jewish biblical scholar, uh, philosopher in the ancient world, most impactful in subsequent centuries. And he was a Hellenist. So he, he loved everything about Greek culture and it affected his whole worldview. So when he looked at the Bible, for example, <clears throat> he interpreted it in very, um, what we would call in the Islamic tradition, very Mutazilite way, you know, very rationalist. Uh, not too keen on miracles and would kind of explain them, you know, meta metamorphosize them away. Um, but what, what, <clears throat> what is, uh, what I find I interesting is that um, his thought uh, as this kind of hugely influential synthesis of Hellenism and Jewish, the Jewish Bible produced some curious ideas. <clears throat> and I just want to read to you from something that Bart Ehrman, Professor Bart Ehrman wrote um, about this philosopher and Bible scholar. And it's a quote from Bart Ehrman's book, How Jesus Became God, where Philo is talking about Moses. Philo was a Jew. Moses was a great lawgiver. Okay. Now, what's interesting and very um, influential historically 
is Philo is talking about Moses in his work as a kind of pre-existent divine being sent to earth. This is a Jewish biblical scholar. And he says this, says Philo, <clears throat> Even And even when God sent him as a loan to the earthly sphere, caused him to dwell there, he fitted him with no ordinary excellence, such as that which kings and rulers had. But he appointed him as God, the small g, placing all the bodily region and the mind which rules it in subjection to him. So that's Bartman's translation of that. And I mention that because... This is such an important idea in, in the history of the West, in Christianity and in philosophy. In the ancient world, uh, as I understand it, this is the ancient Greek world and subsequently the Roman world, the, I, there was a spectrum of divinities. So you, you might have the, 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 the Lord High God, Zeus or Yahweh, whatever, creator of the heavens and the earth. But there were other levels in the hierarchy of being. There were other divinities. And even some of these could be human, humans. So Achilles uh, famously was part human, part divine. And even ordinary humans could be a claim to be God, like Plato was called a God by later Greek writers. And when they, said, when they called human beings God, they didn't literally mean they were Yahweh. It was kind of like an honorific title. So you'd even get in modern English, uh, it's not very common these days, but you get that in, in English there's an expression that she was absolutely divine. You know, she was amazing. She was absolutely divine. You don't really mean they're God, but you're using this language in that way. So <clears throat> um, here we have an example of the preeminent Jewish biblical scholar calling Moses Theos in Greek, which means God. And you know, for Muslims, that's shocking, of course, uh, and deeply tr troubling, to put it mildly. But I, I wanted to mention this because the Hellenization of Jewish thought uh, was was at a very high level. Some some Jews, of course, didn't like this, um, and much more like the Pharisees, they kind of retreated from this. But the more kind of intellectual um, Hellenistic Jews popularized these ideas. And you even see it in the Bible, actually, uh, which we won't go into much today. But there are passages in Isaiah or Psalm 45 where human beings are addressed as God, actually. So Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7 is one example. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, there are examples there, uh, where, where human beings, like the king in those two examples, uh, is addressed as God. Um, it doesn't mean that they thought that they were Yahweh, but they were given divine titles, as was common in the ancient Near East, like in Egypt, for example. Um, so this kind of language, this fluid, promiscuous use of divi divine language, you can see when Christianity came along how it was not unthinkable, even in Jewish circles, to accord divine status to a man without really meaning that he was Yahweh or Allah or anything like that. It was just a very, um, I say, promiscuous, uh, elastic use of divine language. So that's um, very controversial, but nevertheless, it happened. Um, oops, I need to keep an eye on the time. Um, <clears throat> so, um, okay. The the other thing I wanted to mention, another fruit of Hellenization, um, is a very important book with called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Bible. Now, there's a real reason why this is important, and I'll come to this. I'll just tell you what it is, and then explain why it's important. So, because of Hellenization, the spread of Greek culture throughout the entire Middle East, many educated Jews obviously wanted the Bible in Greek, because that's the language they spoke naturally, not Hebrew or Aramaic. They didn't live in Palestine. Most Jews today, for example, don't live in Israel. They live in the United States or Europe or whatever, like just the case, just as it was then too, most Jews did not live in Palestine. They lived, you know, around the Middle East. They might live in, in Egypt or Rome or Turkey or wherever. Um, <clears throat> so they had this Bible translated about 200 BC uh, into Greek. Now, this translation is really, really important because it was translated from the Hebrew, the original language of the Jewish scriptures, into Greek. 
and was widely circulated. And it's this translation that was used by the New Testament writers when they quote from the Bible. They don't quote from the Hebrew. This is a curious thing. New Testament writers, the gospel writers, when Jesus is portrayed as quoting from the Bible, he doesn't quote from the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. He quotes from this Greek translation. And why this matters is it's often quite different from the original. It's often quite different. If you, if you read experts on the Septuagint, like James Barr from Oxford, for example, he, he complains at how poor the translation is sometimes uh, of, of from the original Hebrew. So you have the New Testament founded on an occasionally poor translation of the Jewish scriptures. And it's at times like this that I appreciate the Muslim emphasis on, you know, what is the Quran? Well, the Quran is the Arabic speech of God. It's not my translation into English or Turkish. But for Christians, they use a occasionally dodgy translation as the basis of their receiving the Jewish Bible into the Christian faith when it was interpreted, when it was quoted, and sometimes misquoted. And there's some horrendous examples in the New Testament, we'll come to another time perhaps, of where the New Testament makes important points of doctrine based on a faulty translation of the Hebrew Bible we find in the Septuagint. Uh, there's a passage in Hebrews, for example. Uh, I will go into it now because it's quite technical, but I'm happy to share that with you. Um, so th this, Greek, this Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible became the basis of the Christian Bible, which then obviously became very influential in the West. So another influence of Hellenization on the, the continuing life of the West. So, <clears throat> In the next session, um, oh, so just to conclude this, um, it's a problem that when we have two Bibles, we have a Greek translation, which is the basis of the New, New Testament's own quotes of the Bible, and we have the Hebrew original, which is the inspired word of God. Now, this is a question that Augustine in the fifth century, this great church father, uh, who was from what we call Algeria now, he was one of the last people in the Roman Empire before the, in the West before it collapsed. He, hugely important theologian, early fa uh, church father. Uh, and he discussed this question in his book, De, De Civitatis Dei, The City of God. And he concluded that both are inspired, both are the inspired word of God. So you have the Greek translation, which is inspired by God, and you have the Hebrew original, so to speak, which is also inspired by God. So you have this curious outcome. You have two Bibles which don't always say the same thing, both being equally inspired by God. And he had to reach that conclusion because <clears throat> you had two Bibles. You know, that the, the Septuagint was uh, um, endorsed, quoted and approved of by the New Testament writers. So that's one of the unfortunate outcomes. You, they're both the inspired word of God. Um, so before I, I, I didn't want this to, thank you. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. So um, can we, if the divinity of that is a, an abs absolutely fundamental question. It's a brilliant question. I tend to think the answer is yes, particularly when we look at the fourth gospel, which is commonly seen as the most Hellenized of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there you have a quite a Hellenistic uh, savior figure who is divine in some sense, who is God in some sense. I do stress in some sense because that's the point at issue. So I think, yes, uh, particularly in the beginning of John's gospel, he talks about the Logos. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. The Logos is the Greek word used. Logos is a philosophical term, a stoic term, meaning reason, word, rationality. So Jesus was the, the word of God. And th these are Greek concepts. They're not biblical ones uh, at, at all. That the Stoic sense is there from Greek philosophy. So I think yes. I'm not saying that's the. There are other factors, but I think that the Hellenization of religious thought and language we see in Philo is hugely influential. And many sc scholars acknowledge that Philo's influence on Christian tradition is very great. So yes, I think basically yes. Sorry, yeah, sister. By the way, we've got into all of my Oh, right. Yeah. Cool. Sorry. Sorry, sister, you were saying. Yeah, I was just wondering if you 
conquered. Yes. Well, absolutely, because Alexander Bay conquered uh, the previous slide. Uh, did Greek mythology have a, so what was the, Egyptian mythology and culture Greek culture. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know about that. I think the influence was mainly one way when Alexander conquered Egypt, um, on his way to conquering Turkey and everywhere else. Um, he basically overlaid that society with his city states, his, Theatres, gymnasium, his language, everything was kind of imposed on it. I don't know how much came back from the indigenous culture at that time. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, obviously, Egyptian civilization predated that by a long, long time. Um, you see that obviously with the pyramids and, and everything else. But in terms of the intellectual hegemony, like today we have. Western American or Anglo American hegemony, the dominance of ideas in the West. At that time, it was Greek ideas that dominated, uh, and culture and philosophy. So it basically took over for a long, for many, many centuries. But I don't know the, the, the ancient Egyptian influence on Greek. I don't know much about that, I'm afraid. There must have been some. Uh, yes, please. I think this is, uh, this falls into this overall colonial narrative of how history is written. Influence is always by ways. Uh, by it's the victors. impossible that he went all the way to India. I'm from Pakistan myself, and actually I'm from the area which was conquered by yeah. uh, by by Alexander the Great, uh, where the famous battle with King Porus uh, took place. <clears throat> the influence is always, you know, by ways. Similarly, he conquered Persia, which was the first and the largest empire at that time. Mm -hmm. So there's absolutely no way when he was leaving his generals, these dominions, that they were not being influenced. It's just that when history is written, it's seen as in a very linear way. Can I make one more point? Oh, please do. No, I think you're right. The point about history being, um, being written by the victors is so important. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other comment, Brother Paul, is that, uh, you know, the way, uh, because I'm just making it because this is my area of interest and because there are a lot of young people here, the way history is presented, like you took out the book of ethics and everything else, it's very important to remember that this whole knowledge was complete, completely unknown to Western tradition until about 11th and 12th century, and it was all preserved by Muslims, and it came through <coughs> Muslims. And it also, there's another fine point about how, like, uh, you know, it was emphasized yesterday that we are a civilization of knowledge, uh, because when Muslims took over this um, and translated all the Greek works of Aristotle, Plato, and preserved it and learned from it. Um, Aristotle was called uh, Ustad al Awwal as the first teacher among the Muslims, and Farabi was called Ustad al Sani. He was <coughs> the greatest Muslim, first, uh, first biggest Muslim scholar. Uh, whereas when it all got translated into Latin and came back to the West, the whole history is obliterated. And there are lots of examples yeah, of, true. you know, everything. People just seem to think that between Augustine and Aquinas mm -hmm. and then jumping up to Descartes, there was nothing happening. Whereas if you read the history, uh, and I've got a lot of research done on this myself, you will see that a lot of these ideas on base, which provide the basis of like John Locke's theory of mm -hmm. uh, liberal democracy or modern foundations of science, they actually came through. No, that, that's, that's all very true. I think Aristotle is a great example of um, the transmission of knowledge through the Muslim world to the West, as you say. And Aristotle was hugely, he was known as the philosopher. He didn't even, wasn't even called by name, which is as the philosopher said. And people like Ibn Sina, Evores, uh, 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 as he's called in the West, Ibn Sina. Sorry? Ibn Sina, thank you. Um, is, uh, you know, uh, was very much influenced by Aristotle's thought, as were many of the Islamic philosophers, of course, um, as, as well. But um, I would slightly disagree. I think Plato um, was known of in the West before Muslims came along, and was very influential. I mentioned Augustine. He, he, Augustine seen as a Platonic philosopher and theologian in many ways. And Nietzsche, the great German um, anti-theologian, uh, but basically said that um, Christianity is Platonism for the masses. 
you know, it, it's it's not real Christianity from Jesus. It's kind of platonic thought just for the masses. That was Nietzsche's quip, mm -hmm. and as usual, he was brilliant in that insight. So Plato was very, was what known, but Aristotle, as you say, was uh, uh, read, treasured, studied by the Muslims, and then passed on to the West, where he was hugely influential on someone like Thomas Aquinas, who was probably the preeminent. Western Christian theologian and philosopher in the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas in Paris. Aquinas was greatly influenced mm. by Ambrose as well as Al Ghazali. True. True. Yeah. Uh, and he mentions Al Ghazali several times yeah, yeah. in his writings <clears throat> as well. Yeah, absolutely. But that's again something. Uh, the point I'm just simply making mm. is because a lot of young people may not know this and they need to know that you know we have a great and rich tradition yeah. which has given foundations to what Isaac Newton called, you know, standing on the giants of the shoulders of the giants. giants. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So. No, that's true. And uh, Aristotle, uh, Aquinas was very influenced by uh, Aristotle. Uh, and, and thus, if you look at the modern catechism of the Catholic Church, this is the, the catechism is like a teaching tool that the Roman Catholic Church uses today. We published it about in the 1980s, the latest version. And you look at <clears throat> the ethics there, a lot of it is warmed over or, or what I call baptized Aristotelian thought. So you get the, almost the language of virtue and vice and morality is, is, is pretty thinly disguised Aristotle, actually. Because as I said before, there's not much in the New Testament about this. If you want a detailed, thorough working out of how to be ethical and moral, there's not much in the Bible. But there's acres and acres in Aristotle. So the, ch the church baptized, as I call it, baptized Aristotle and made, and made him its own. But the Muslim world also, uh, very much assimilated Aristotle as well. And that's controversial, of course, in the Muslim world, um, about the role of philosophy. You know, I mean, uh, uh, famously Al-Ghazali in his, uh, you know, incoherence of the philosophers and then someone else's response, the incoherence of the incoherence. And it's very, it's very controversial, and particularly with some Salafi brothers who obviously reject all philosophy. And, and it, you know, we are going to um, Ibn Taymiyyah and everything like that. So, but in the West, I, my view is that secular pagan philosophy has been taken on board completely uh, and assimilated right into our DNA. Whereas in the Islam, in Muslim world, it's much more problematic uh, and priority is usually given to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, upon him peace, rather than what Aristotle say. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, the Prophet doesn't quote Aristotle, but uh, obviously, um, but in the West, you quote Aristotle uh, if you want to be taken seriously as an ethicist someone who thinks about morality. And that's true today, by the way, amongst educated people. It's not just archaeology, ye old ancient past. This is today. If you if you talk to an educated Westerner, they're going to know about Aristotle. They're going to know about Plato. Um, you won't read about it necessarily on CNN or you won't see it in Disney movies, but in terms of, you know, the thought, it's there, I think. And it's the idea of thinking critically, of, of using your mind and not accepting any revelation or presuppositions that just on the basis of thought alone, you might be able to reach conclusions about what it is to be virtuous, what it is to be a good person, how to run an, a, 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 an ordered society that is a benefit to people. Rationality, logos, reason is at the heart of it. Whereas Muslims or, the, or Jews or Christians have usually given priority to what God has said. Do you see how different that is? You know, I mean, well, the first question, you know, about contemporary issues is not what does reason tell, what has God said? Because he made us, he created us. That's the first question I think Muslims ask, and many Christians too. But in, in the modern world, influenced by these ideas, well, what is rationally the case? You know, let, let, let's argue about it from our own minds alone. <laughs> and that's arguably, you know, a big difference. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's a good. Show. Yeah. If revelation there is not in the sense that we would understand it, I think that that the Plato taught his students in the academy. He formed the perhaps arguably the first university in history. You know, called the Academy in Athens, um, an actual university. And by the way, can anyone guess? You've got to have one expertise in one subject to enrol in Plato's Academy. Can anyone, can anyone guess what that expertise must be? 
wrestling. Not wrestling. No, 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 not quite. No, it's mathematics. You had to be proficient in maths to enter the academy in, uh, in Athens. It's extraordinary. So this training of the mind. Anyway. Um, Plato had a, a theory of forms. I haven't mentioned this yet. I'll just briefly, this was a really important idea he had. So when we look at the world around us, the transient world, we see chairs, we see cars, we see people, um, we see objects. These are, he, he said, imperfect copies of the perfect ideas or forms of a chair, a car, a person, a color. So that there is in the transcendent realm a perfect um, color red or a perfect chair. And the, what we see in the world around us are imperfect copies of that. So the idea is the philosopher should reach, be using a particular philosophical method, should transcend the mundane, the dunya, if you like, into the transcendent realm. And, and that, in a way, is to acquire wisdom about true knowledge, about reality. So it's not like revelations of what did the messenger say, what did the prophet say, but the philosopher could train you to apprehend the truth about the forms. And there's a form of the good, there's the form of virtue, the forms of all, all the, the essences of the things that we see around us. And this is his theory of forms. Um, so by philosophical discipline, you could um, move away from this transient world and participate in some way in the divine realm. Um, uh, you, you, you read about you read about it in his dialogues, like the Republic and the Symposium and other things. Discuss this, particularly in Symposium. This is a basically a banquet, a bunch of dudes being served by slaves. Just happens to be the case. Talking about love, what is love? And they move from a, a very kind of fleshly understanding of love um, up until the, a very noble kind of love into a divine love. And this was seen as the superior form of love where you love God or the divine for its own sake. And this book called The Symposium, which is actually a really great read, um, is a dialogue, a conversation between different people at this banquet. And that's a good introduction to Plato's ideas about the divine as well, I think. Sorry. Yeah. I think my question probably connects, um, but could you clarify the, the difference in terms of where they're pointing? Yes, that's, Plato absolutely. Sorry, this has gone gone cold on me. And I'm not sure how to activate it. No. Do you know? Sorry about that. I've got my MacBook Pro and I just tap it and it pings into life. But this one is uh, not a MacBook Pro. I won't tell you what it is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it yes. Of course it's in, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Ah, oh, they have a couple of gaps. You just need that's it. right. Okay, that's a good start. No. Um, okay, well, uh, I unless we can get it up. Um, in the fresco by Raphael uh, in the Vatican, you have uh, right at the center, you have Plato and Aristotle, and um, Plato. Um, is, po is pointing up, literally. He's actually Leonardo da Vinci. He's actually a life portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. It's amazing. Um, he's pointing up. So he's pointing to the transcendent realm, to the forms, the divine. And Aristotle is literally standing like that. It's a very dramatic pose. And he is pointing at all those uh, investigations in this world that he came to found, like zoology, biology. Uh, and, and logic and so on. all of this is something that he basically founded in the world and so you get this wonderful juxtaposition these two guys knew each other one was the teacher of the other one what's missing of course in that is socrates for some reason he's not in that picture um, but there's a whole bunch of other characters uh, and one of them is ibn sina as i mentioned and uh and even the artist himself is at the bottom um a self-portrait so he actually appears in his own fresco uh, in the vatican so does that yeah, but I guess in terms of like, did Aristotle accept kind of the same ideas of form and transcendence and those types of things? Apparently not, actually. No, that's a really good point. Apparently not. No, there's just, I think he was very critical of his teacher, Plato. Um, and you get, you get that sense very clearly in his preoccupations with, uh, empirical observations. So kind of like a proto science as well. So he actually looked at 
fishes and sea anemones and, and stuff he saw and classified them. Um, zoology, I mean, this has never been done before. Um, so he's a founder of zoology. He was in, intensely cur curious uh, of the world around him and didn't seem to have that much interest in, uh, there's no evidence he believed in forms, these theory of forms or ideas. He was very much a dunya centered rather than anything else. So they were quite different, oddly. Yeah. So, Sorry. Can you think that uh, Plato was this statement No, 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 he's no, he's not. No, he's not. He's not an atheist or anything. No, no, no. No, um, Aristotle has this idea of the prime mover. The prime mover. You, you find this in Greek, in sorry, in um, Islamic philosophy as well. Uh, the, the idea that there has to be a first cause, and that first cause is God. Um, but he didn't have a, a rich monotheistic concept that we would associate with Moses or Jesus or Muhammad, peace be upon them all. That, that doesn't seem to be there. But he certainly wasn't an atheist and did believe in a divine cause of the universe. And I think we, we would call that de deism or deism today. Um, the idea that a divine being set up the universe, set it in motion, and basically left it to get on with it, you know, like a clockwork, and doesn't intervene or answer prayers or anything like uh, anything like that. Um, that would seem to be a difference. Where Plato, I, I'm not sure quite what he, he seems to be more polytheistic. Um, so, but he had a much richer understanding of the divine realm, though. So, yes. Oh, it's quite different today, yeah. Because obviously, in those days, in, in Athens, democracy, which which was born in, um, mm -hmm. by the way, it's just kind of a side, a side, a bit of a side comment. People often criticise. In the West, criticize Muslims. Oh, you believe in a, a system that came about 1,400 years ago, you know, as if there's some kind of criticism, you know. Well, we're much more modern, I'm saying. The people in the West follow the democratic system, which was created two and a half thousand years ago, much, much older than that. So, what's your point again? You know, if you want to talk about seriously old fashioned systems, where democracy is a much older system than, say, than, say the Sharia is. And yet they, they seem to realize this, you know. But um, the, the original democratic system in Athens was restricted to people who could vote. You were male, property owners. Um, you couldn't be a woman. You couldn't be a slave. Uh, and a whole bunch. Of, so it really was restricted to an elite. But the principle was there that the, you, 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 decisions were reached in the city-states by majority vote. Can you give a definition of democracy? Just well, in the Greek, the Greek word demos, and, uh, demos means people. Uh, and uh, uh, accuracy or uh, uh, archi means rulership. Um, so it'd be rulership by the people. It would be a literal, because it's a composite word, demos and archi. Archi means rulership, uh, and demos means people. So it's ruled by the people. Whereas, um, obviously, the Muslim equivalent would be rulership by, by divine law rather than what people just think is right at any given whim. <laughs> Sorry. No, I think it's a good point. I, I mean, for my, my, and this is a controversial because scholars disagree about Socrates, but my, my reading of, of him is that he doesn't really provide answers to questions. He's great at kind of debunking people, showing that pretensions to knowledge are empty and, and exercising his critical fac faculties. 
but he doesn't kind of provide answers. And he kind of wants to know, well, what is the answer at the end of the day? Um, and uh, only faith can, uh, religions provide those answers from a transcendent source. So you, you could argue that Socrates falls short quite a way. Um, but the Socratic method was adopted uh, and by many uh, Islamic philosophers and other Western philosophers as well. And it's still prized by them um, because it's just a good way of thinking. But it doesn't really give, give us much. And we want answers. You know, what does it mean to be and what is pleasing to God? And Socrates won't tell you that, I don't think, in my view. So it's very limited, I think. And that's typical of the West. A lot of these answers are not really substantial. And you have to look to, to God for, for answers rather than opinions of men. And they usually are men. Sorry. Yeah, uh, the, the, my starting point would always be go back to first principles to tell the existence of God, because we're not going to go anywhere until we agree on what reality is. Instead of arguing about this aspect of feminist theory or whatever, it's start well, you know, what, what, what is reality about? So God exists, has he... Uh, Revealed his will to us, has he spoken to us, the prophets and messengers, and so on. And let's look at that uh, as a starting point before we go into the details. Rather than letting the, 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 the tail wag the dog, we need to start off with fundamentals. Does that make sense? So that's, that's for me is where Socrates might have limited use as a training in thinking, but he doesn't give us the answers we need to live. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's see if we can. I need to, I don't know how to go. I used to. So the West is full of these kind of double standards. They'll praise the great conqueror, but criticize, and they'll criticize Muslims for having, you know, a very ancient moral system or rulership system, and yet they will uncritically accept democracy, which is far, far older and is based on purely man's opinion. So you get these kind of, this idea of the double standards, double think is very common, actually, in Western thought, unfortunately, in my view. So, Can we say that the skeptical approach that Socrates had reached a level of solipsism or is it even possible to reach that level? Solipsism. Hmm. Solipsism is I, I, I don't, I yes, number one. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Again, the Socratic method is a method rather than an, a series of answers. He's just asking questions. I, I don't get the sense that he questions the existence of other people around him, solipsism. He's, so th this is the, um, so that's Leonardo da Vinci actually, um, modeling Plato, and that's Aristotle uh, doing this dramatic pose. Look at the world, look at the species, look at the, uh, and Plato's pointing to God. Um, sometimes people think that was, that's actually the artist himself. Um, I can't quite tell here which is Ibn Sina, um, because it's not a very clear picture, but it's the one with the turban. I'm not sure one can see it, but there's a dude there with a the turban, it's Ibn Sina, who's, um, uh, uh, c could be. It's, Actually, I, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure that is the one. There's another one. I thought it was somewhere around here, but I'm sorry, the picture's not very clear. Otherwise, it'd be easier to spot. If if, if it was clear, I could identify him. But uh, it's a bit. Anyway, uh, you can Google it yourself. This is a very popular image on, online. You can see it for yourself. And there's a vast wall in in the Vatican. Um, that this is a fresco, so it's painted directly onto 